Ladies and gentlemen, if you will please take your seats. Good morning uh, and welcome to CSIS. We are delighted that you were here. Many of you canoed or swam here uh, from the uh, the terrible flooding. And in fact, uh, our apologies for beginning a few minutes late. We had some speakers that were stuck in some traffic, so we were waiting for them to uh, to to arrive. My name is Heather Conley. I'm senior fellow and director here at the Europe Pro of the Europe program at CSIS. And we are delighted that you are here, and we are looking forward to such a rich discussion about a very dynamic uh, region, the Asia-Pacific region. There has been an enormous amount of transatlantic discussion and unity over the past several weeks about the crisis in Ukraine and transatlantic policy towards Russia. But today we have an opportunity to talk about a transatlantic approach and uh, to discuss uh, Asia. Uh, again, I, I want to congratulate the Center for Transatlantic Relations to Dan Hamilton, Hans Bendendijk. Uh, they have uh, organized and put together a fantastic program of uh, very senior Obama administration officials, very uh, senior former Bush administration officials, senior Europeans, to really bring a very rich dynamic discussion. Of course, uh, that we save uh, the best for last, uh, and we'll have the Dutch foreign minister, Minister Timmermans, here to provide the keynote. So you may be wondering, if this is a Center for Transatlantic Relations project, why are we here at CSIS? Well, my friends, this is great uh, think tank co cooperation and partnership, and this project fits so perfectly uh, with a CSIS project with the European Union delegation to create an EU-US dialogue on the Asia-Pacific region. So we're working in the same area and we're pulling strength from one another. Again, congratulations. We're going to have copies of this book for you uh, at the end of the program. We just wanted you to listen to the speakers and not read this riveting document. Uh, but here it is, A Transatlantic Pivot to Asia Towards New Trilateral Partnerships. Again, we know what an undertaking this is. My congratulations to the authors, again, to, to Hans and, and to Dan. One of my very first projects before uh, is coming to CSIS was working with Dan on a major book like this on, on really strengthening US-EU cooperation. I know what goes into this, and again, it, it is a, fan, a fantastic uh, opportunity. So I will be back with you in moderating the second panel, uh, but until then, uh, you are most welcome. We look forward to a rich discussion. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. And with that, I will welcome uh, the Executive Director of the Center for Transatlantic Relations, Dan Hamilton, to give you a few more words about this exciting project. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Thanks everyone for coming today. We appreciate it very much. Uh, I think we have a, a very rich uh, agenda and a lot of uh, substance in the meeting, but first let me thank CSIS, Heather, and your team for working with us on this. We appreciate it. Uh, you can see another reason why we want to be here. It's very nice. Uh, CSIS has uh, become our new neighbor. Uh, I can look at our building, of so at one building of Johns Hopkins Science right there, uh, and so it's really become really uh, a great dynamic uh, development here. Um, as I think many of you know, so we are uh, what's called the EU Center in Washington, working with the other uh, area universities on U.S.-EU relations and do a lot of uh, uh, things on that. So if there are other colleagues from the other uh, universities, Georgetown, uh, George Washington, American, George Mason, I want to say hello. Um, and uh, this particular project has been the work uh, of a, a group of authors, many, uh, almost I think all of them are here. In fact, I want to thank them for all of their uh, work. Uh, it's a typical type of think tank product and that we uh, boil this down into so, you know, okay, what, what does this all mean? What do we got to do? Uh, and that sort of cheat sheet, if you will, the sort of quick uh, couple page agenda is out on the table uh, in front of this room if you haven't seen that. So instead of 300 pages, it's uh, I think three pages. Uh, but uh, that's geared to the, uh, the Washington and, and uh, European uh, decision maker world. 
Um, but we have been doing this in collaboration uh, with our colleagues from the Dutch Foreign Ministry, and I want to really take the opportunity uh, to thank them. Uh, we'll see the Foreign Minister later, and that'll, that's an uh, embodiment of that <coughs> cooperation. But uh, I've always been struck and uh, really refreshed when I, uh, when I deal with my Dutch colleagues, because they have a very big view. Uh, and uh, uh, this idea of how do we talk about the pivot together uh, they immediately, you know, joined in on that, and we've had meetings in The Hague with the authors uh, and here, and we'll continue that uh, discussion. So what we've tried to do here <clears throat> is to bring again a collection of experts in what we think is will have to be increasingly the norm, <clears throat> but it's still an exception, and that is people who really are experts on Asia and the Pacific, uh, and experts who are uh, knowledgeable about the U.S.-European relationship. And often what we, what's happening is sort of me see, sort of seeing what's going on is often we, when we say let's talk about China or something, we get the China experts from the U.S. and Europe together, but then there's not somebody that actually is talking about well, how the U.S. and Europe work together. And so sometimes I think there's sort of a mismatch of uh, discussion because people aren't quite sure what the mechanisms are that would allow the U.S. and Europe to work together. And then often uh, the uh, traditional transatlantic crowd, if you will, uh, then say, well, we have to now talk about China. Does anybody in the room know anything about China? Uh, and so clearly uh, there's a missing link uh, in those traditional discussions as well. So I think we've tried to bridge that uh, with this collection. We have a number of people who are really experts on Asia and the Pacific and practitioners. Uh, I want to just point out Michael here, uh, Michael Schaefer, who was the German ambassador to China for six years, uh, has rich experience there, but he was also the political director of the German Foreign Office. He and I worked on the Balkans together uh, some years ago, uh, and that's the kind of expansive uh, experience that uh, is really, uh, I think, very, uh, very good to put together. So the premise of this uh, work is, uh, if you just take the United States, the United States is a, an Atlantic and a Pacific power. It has been for a while now. Uh, and when the term the pivot came out, I think there was um, some uncertainty or misunderstanding, especially in Europe, about what that meant. Uh, and we will talk about this later, but you know, originally the term emerged more out of the defense world in terms of pivoting away from uh, military engagements in Central Asia and, and uh, the broader Middle East toward security challenges now uh, arising again in, in the Asia Pacific region. It was not intended uh, as a pivot away from Europe. In fact, I think many in the, uh, the administration and many will say that. It was intended to actually start working with Europe on that. But it was not quite understood that way because at the same time, of course, we were talking about a post-Cold War type of structure in Europe. Uh, and so I think the two conflated in, in the minds of some Europeans to say, well, the United States is really moving away from our relationship as well. So we hope to address that uh, with some of this uh, in, the, in the work. Um, but I think if you look at uh, Europe, uh, Europe is uh, increasingly intertwined uh, with Asia, again. Uh, but in many, many, many different ways. And that element, the Europe-Asia, uh, Europe-Asia-Pacific dynamic, maybe is not as well understood in Washington. Uh, and it has its own dynamics. Uh, and so uh, we're trying to lift that part of the conversation into these uh, discussions as well. So Europe has its own stakes in what's happening in Asia, very deep linkages in many, uh, many areas, but some are uneven. And when we say, we, Americans like to say Europe as if it's one thing. Uh, and as soon as you go to Europe, you know it's not uh, yet. Uh, and despite our colleagues in the EU, uh, you know, each member state of the EU has its own views. So the Europeans bring a whole another diversity of experience and uh, different uh, values, and, and not different values, I think, but different uh, interests to some of the issues of the Asia Pacific. So I think the third piece to this, when we say pivot, I've been arguing for some time, but I think this reinforces it, <clears throat> is the transatlantic relationship has had to pivot. Uh, not in just a geographic sense, but in terms of the, the nature of the relationship itself. Because during the Cold War, 
really you could say about 80, 80 90 percent of our agenda when we said transatlantic relations, we meant stabilizing the European continent. It was about Europe, really. Uh, we had other issues, but it was about stabilizing Europe. Uh, today, given the developments, we're still about stabilizing Europe, uh, and that's still an important piece of our relationship. But the relationship is broadened so that it's not 90% of our agenda. We have to focus on developments in Ukraine. We have to develop, focus on the security of wider Europe now in, in a way that maybe we hadn't for some time. And that's really still a core element uh, of the agenda, but it's not the whole agenda. I think the other pivot that we've had to make uh, is to understand the deep integration of our economies in a world of globalization, in a world in which we're facing you know, at least four billion other new workers uh, who are also part of the global economy. And so how do you pivot the U.S. European economic relationship to deal with this very new world rising. Much of it's about opening up opportunity across the Atlantic. That's what the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership is about. But the TTIP, as we call it, is not just about that. It's about repositioning the two sides of the Atlantic for the world we're facing in the future, not the world we left behind. And that's an equally important pivot. And then the third pivot, it seems, is in fact to address how Europeans and Americans, how and whether, we will work together on a whole range of global and extra-regional issues, very far from European or American shores, but where if you don't get the Europeans and Americans to work together, you're not going to get much of a coalition that does work very well together. And if you do get them together, usually at least there's a core there of a much bigger coalition that get, get things done. I think that's still distinctive about our relationship across the Atlantic. But now we're facing uh, uh, really critical challenges, but also huge opportunities presented by the Asia Pacific region. And that is the nature of our book, and that's the nature of our discussions here today. So I'm going to uh, uh, welcome uh, Danny uh, Russell, who has joined us now. Uh, Danny, we explained everybody was stuck in traffic today, I think, so uh, <laughs> uh, we appreciate your, uh, your being here. What we try to do in the conference is bring some uh, current decision makers who have to grapple with these issues every day together with our authors. As I said, many of the authors were themselves, have themselves been in those positions, uh, and try to tease out what could be a concrete agenda of how U.S. and Europe work with Asia Pacific uh, partners. Uh, Hans Benedike has been our editor and leader on this effort, and he will uh, join in uh, soon. Uh, and has really directed the whole project. And Hans, thank you again for everything you've done. So Danny is here, and I want to now just briefly introduce him. You have bios, I think, so I don't need to uh, read everything. But uh, we actually got to uh, work together when he was uh, worked with Tom Pickering and when he was uh, roaming the seventh floor of the State Department, uh, getting everybody else organized, uh, working for the Undersecretary for Political Affairs. But Danny's had this great, uh, also transatlantic, transpacific uh, experience, uh, not only based in The Hague, which is great for this project, <laughs> uh, but also uh, based a number of times uh, postings in Asia, particularly in Osaka, which seems to be your place of uh, choice in, in various postings. Uh, also uh, special assistant to the president for Asian affairs, um, and now uh, the assistant secretary for, uh, for state for East uh, Asian and Pacific Affairs. So it's a great uh, way to start the scene to get a, a view from Danny on uh, how do we think about this region, what perspectives might there be for the U.S. and Europe to uh, address the region, uh, and how does the U.S. Uh, view, view the dynamics. So please, Danny Russell. Dan, thanks very much. Hans, I apologize for being late. I see some uh, friendly and familiar faces uh, here today. Um, it's great to be at CSIS, and it's a privilege to speak at uh, this conference. You have some outstanding uh, speakers uh, in the course of the day, myself not included. Um, my former boss and friend Chris Hill is coming. I know uh, Derek Chalet and, of course, uh, uh, Minister Timmermans, uh, which is great. I want to tell the Center for Transatlantic relations that I think this is a, a terrific review of U.S. and European policy towards the Asia-Pacific region. Um, 
there are some really good ideas in uh, the report about it, how we can uh, work even more closely together. It's no surprise to me that uh, the Dutch government has uh, a role in this project and in today's conference, given uh, forward-looking and expansive uh, diplomacy uh, towards the region that's been a hallmark of, of the Netherlands. Uh, as Dan mentioned, um, I served at the U.S. Embassy in The Hague for uh, three years as the Deputy Chief of Mission uh, as part of the six years that I've worked in Europe in the U.S. Foreign Service. And it's clear to me that the trade ties uh, with Asia will, will play an increasing role uh, for the Netherlands uh, and for Europe uh, for their future prosperity, just as they have in, in the past, in, in the 17th century. I was back in The Hague uh, last month with President Obama during the Nuclear Security Summit and uh, participated in the President's meetings with President Park of South Korea and Prime Minister Abe of uh, Japan, as well as uh, his bilateral meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping, who went on, I know, to hold a, a series of uh, visits uh, throughout Western Europe. So along with Europe's increasing engagement in Asia, uh, our US-EU cooperation in the, in the Asia Pacific region uh, is important and is extensive. It's indispensable, uh, it's growing, uh, and frankly, it's a significant feature of our own strategy of, of rebalance. Um, let me start by giving you uh, the broader policy context of our strategy in the Asia Pacific region, our, our rebalance strategy. It's built on a very simple proposition that uh, the U.S. Uh, views Asia, the Asia Pacific, as hugely consequential to our economic and our security um, future, both as a resident Asia Pacific power and as a major trading nation, the U.S. simply depends on a stable and a prosperous uh, Asia. The broader Asia Pacific Rim region, including the U.S., constitutes over half of the world's people, half of the world's economic output, and the numbers are growing. So the region matters for the United States economy. Uh, it's key to creating jobs uh, for us here at home. And it matters very much for our long-term security, and we simply can't afford uh, not to be there in an active role. So we're working hard to build stronger and closer uh, relationships uh, and ties bilaterally and plurilaterally uh, with the region. So given this perspective, when policymakers at the beginning of the Obama administration in 2009 looked at how the U.S. Uh, government's resources were distributed, how they were allocated uh, through the region, that means diplomatic, uh, development, personnel, uh, funds, other military assets. It also means the time and attention of senior leaders themselves. It was clear that the U.S. was still somewhat out of balance. So over the last five and a half years, the administration worked to, to rebalance, to achieve the right kind of uh, equilibrium in the allocation of our resources. And that meant, in the first instance, strengthening America's alliances in Asia. It meant, secondly, um, contributing to the development of regional institutions, of the regional architecture. And thirdly, it meant engaging with the emerging powers in the Asia Pacific region. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit more perspective on each of those three areas. The U.S. has five treaty allies in, in Asia, Australia, uh, Japan, the Republic of Korea, uh, Thailand, and the Philippines. Uh, and as a matter of deliberate policy, we have uh, significantly enhanced uh, our alliances. Uh, we've upgraded our military uh, cooperation and interoperability. 
Um, but we've also expanded security cooperation uh, with important partners like Singapore, like New Zealand, uh, and even increasingly with uh, countries like Vietnam and uh, with Malaysia. At the same time, we've upgraded our economic and trade engagement. Uh, we've uh, enacted and ratified the U.S.-Korea uh, Free Trade Agreement, the CHORUS, FTA. Uh, we are negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, uh, which is an ambitious, comprehensive, high stakes, uh, high standards and high stakes agreement uh, that will create jobs and uh, create growth uh, among the 12 members among the region and globally. Uh, and recently in uh, Japan, as the President and Ambassador Froman have indicated, uh, we made significant headway uh, in the bilateral negotiations that are the critical next step in uh, developing the, uh, the TPP. But we've also increased our diplomatic and our political and our people-to-people -people, uh, ties, uh, uh, particularly with uh, our allies. And President Obama's uh, just concluded trip, I got back two nights ago, uh, is his fifth trip uh, to the region as president. Uh, and it included visits to three allied uh, nations and, and one important partner, Malaysia. Um, there are quite a few cabinet officers uh, who travel on a regular basis to the Asia Pacific region and we also foster business and cultural, educational, scientific, other direct links uh, among our peoples. Uh, on this trip, the President announced a new program to double exchanges uh, between the U.S. and Japan, for example. Uh, and he also launched a major uh, young Southeast Asian leaders uh, initiative, a program that will support the region's next generation. We've also, as I mentioned, uh, significantly deepened our military and security cooperation with our allies. You'll hear from Derek Chalet uh, today, I know. Um, but it includes our work with Japan, uh, with the ROK, uh, in order to counter the threat from uh, North Korean nuclear and ballistic missile program. It includes new uh, forms of defense cooperation uh, that allow not for new bases, but for access, joint operations, and interoperability, such as the enhanced defense cooperation agreement that uh, was reached uh, during the President's visit to the Philippines uh, a few days ago. It includes our rotational deployment of Marines to Darwin, Australia. Uh, and it includes a broader systematic uh, program of capacity building uh, throughout Southeast Asia. Secondly, we're helping to build up the region's institutions uh, to address the political, security, and economic uh, challenges and opportunities that uh, are presented. We, the United States, were the first non-ASEAN member to uh, dedicate a permanent mission to ASEAN in Jakarta. President Obama participates annually in the East Asia Summit, uh, having made the fundamental decision uh, not to wait until the East Asia Summit perfected itself before we joined, uh, but to get in there, roll up his sleeves, participate actively in uh, shaping and developing the region's institutions. He also meets annually with uh, the 10 leaders of ASEAN uh, on innovation uh, in the Obama administration. And in addition to the work on TPP, we are also active within APEC uh, in the effort to liberalize trade and investment rules and to promote sustainable and inclusive growth. So these regional institutions also uh, serve as a platform for fostering uh, dialogue, fostering understanding, and helping the countries in the region uh, to interact in ways that are likely to develop collaborative uh, patterns of operation. Uh, we, want a w we want the countries in the region to operate on the basis of dialogue and diplomacy. 
So whether it's a code of conduct for claimants in the South China Sea, whether it's managing uh, shared and dwindling resources like uh, fisheries, uh, or whether it's addressing pollution uh, that crosses borders, building up these institutions creates uh, a vehicle for constructive uh, multilateral interaction. The third pillar of the rebalance that I mentioned is uh, our engagement with emerging powers. Now, this traditionally has meant uh, countries like India, Indonesia, and of course China. Uh, and we have high level, uh, regular, ongoing, and uh, in-depth discussions with all three, with each of these three countries on a wide range of uh, bilateral and global issues through a variety of uh, bilateral mechanisms. But a broader definition of emerging powers uh, could also include the modernizing uh, countries of the region like Vietnam, like uh, Malaysia, and I certainly harbor the hope someday, uh, Burma, Myanmar, where um, I traveled uh, last month as part of our effort to support that remarkable and important uh, transition to uh, democracy and free markets. So these three pillars support and reinforce each other. Uh, strengthening our alliances provides the foundation for security for the region. Uh, it gives countries the confidence and the space to move forward on their collective interests and to strengthen the institutions. And building up these institutions in turn uh, helps the region develop uh, the rules of the road that are so important to uh, stability and to um, progress. And those rules uh, developed, uh, not imposed on the nations, but developed by the nations uh, of the Asia Pacific themselves, those rules provide the foundation for trade, for prosperity, and for problem solving. That's uh, a closely held tenet of the president and of the administration. Furthermore, our engagement with these emerging powers shows that we're welcoming of uh, new voices. We are not locked into an immutable status quo. Uh, we're committed to building positive sum, not zero sum, uh, relationships and approaches. And fundamentally, it shows that the United States supports the peaceful rise of China that plays a responsible role in regional and in global affairs. So these are all areas where I believe that uh, Europe brings some significant uh, comparative advantages. And with that as the context, I'll talk a little bit about how we coordinate with Europe since uh, our interests in the region are so, so closely aligned. I myself, in the nine months that I've been uh, in the, my current position as Assistant Secretary, have gone twice already to Europe uh, for the purpose of discussing uh, and coordinating on, on, on policy towards the Asia Pacific region. Um, I spent uh, some time in Brussels and other European capitals uh, in January this, this year to consult with uh, the EU and with some of the member states on how we can deepen our coordination. Uh, and I'm very encouraged by uh, the European countries' engagement with Asia, uh, dating back to our joint pledge in 2011 at the US-EU uh, summit where we resolved to increase cooperation. And since then, we've met uh, numerous times to discuss practical and concrete areas where we can uh, partner in the region. I think that the US and Europe have never been more strategically aligned. Uh, we've never been more focused on the opportunities uh, in Asia. And it's also clear to me, uh, operating in the region, that Asia Pacific welcomes uh, Europe, welcomes European interest in trade and in international uh, security, and wants that engagement to be sustained and expanded both bilaterally and uh, through the European Union. But just as we see opportunities, we obviously also face very serious uh, challenges throughout the region. Um, those include the ongoing threat from 
North Korea's nuclear and ballistic missile program, as I mentioned, uh, as well as uh, that country's truly deplorable human rights uh, record. We're seeing um, significant maritime and territorial disputes uh, in the East and the South China Seas. The historical issues uh, that create tensions between Japan and its neighbors can undermine growth, uh, can undermine regional stability. There are uh, political and social and economic tensions boiling uh, in countries like Cambodia and in Thailand. We have a formidable uh, task in promoting uh, continued political reform in Burma. Uh, we have other democratic challenges in the region, uh, such as in Fiji. Uh, and in addition to our efforts to support individual countries, uh, we have a lot of work to do on transnational and global challenges uh, that have a huge impact on the region. Um, by far and away, the most consequential uh, being uh, climate change and environmental degradation. Yet, um, for all the challenges uh, we are seeing and we are making important progress, um, I mentioned TPP and uh, the progress in the negotiations there and with other economic agreements. And uh, as you know well, the high standards being set in TPP will complement the high standards uh, of the TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership that the U.S. is negotiating with Europe. This inclusive set of trade relationships can have tremendous benefit uh, for the Asia-Pacific region uh, by harmonizing consumer product regulations between the U.S. and uh, the EU. Asian manufacturers, for example, will more efficiently produce goods for both markets. We're also making progress in developing rules, uh, rules that promote security. Last week um, in Beijing, uh, nearly two dozen nations uh, in the region adopted a new uh, agreement, what is called a Code for Unplanned Encounters uh, at Sea. And this sort of naval code, uh, while voluntary uh, and informal, um, creates a framework that helps pre prevent uh, potentially dangerous incidents, uh, a huge concern uh, right now in the region. It's modest, but it's still a very positive development that can help reduce the risk of misunderstanding and dangerous interaction between uh, ships, naval ships, and naval aircraft in the region. And my hope is that it can spur progress uh, in efforts to conclude a code of conduct between uh, ASEAN and China in the South China Sea, as well as uh, spur progress in developing uh, agreements and mechanisms to avoid and prevent incidents uh, between Japan and China in the East China Sea. Secretary Kerry and certainly I put a very high premium on coordinating with Europe in Asia as part of our strong uh, global Atlantic alliance and partnerships. And I should be clear that although my area of responsibility is East Asia and the Pacific, um, I'm well aware of the extent to which the US and Europe cooperate across the spectrum of South and Central Asia, from Afghanistan to Iran to the Middle East. Um, we work together to address not only the challenges that I've mentioned and, uh, and build on uh, progress there, but uh, develop other areas uh, where jointly we can make a difference. In the Asia Pacific region, I think it's absolutely fair to say that um, America's involvement in the rebalance, America's commitment to the Asia Pacific region doesn't and shouldn't and won't come at the expense of our engagement across the Atlantic. Um, more attention to Asia does not mean less attention to Europe. That's not what the pivot is. Uh, we haven't and we won't pivot away from uh, the Atlantic to focus on the Pacific. Um, 
to the contrary, um, as I've said, we have common interests and I think we can do far more uh, together uh, than we could hope to do independently. Uh, a classic example being the collaboration uh, on North Korea human rights, where by working together over the past few months, we got a, an unprecedentedly strong vote in the Human Rights Council, and we raised uh, the DPRK human rights uh, issue for the first time at an informal meeting of the UN Security Council resolution. So these kinds of efforts uh, underline the shared values that make us such good partners, uh, make us such uniquely close uh, friends and allies. And uh, with the challenges facing the world, clearly there's a growing demand for uh, our collaboration, our engagement, uh, and our leadership. So in keeping with uh, the very thoughtful recommendations and conclusions in, in the report, uh, we certainly want to see deeper coordination, deeper consultation with Europe on a whole range of Asia-Pacific uh, opportunities and challenges. So having uh, arrived late, let me stop here and uh, uh, take any questions that time will allow. Yeah, we are pressed for time, so is Danny, but I think if we uh, just collect, if okay, Danny, just a couple questions, we'll let you just answer those, then I think we will probably be good. Uh, so, yes, right here. Uh, we have microphones, I understand. So if you could just say who you are, so Danny has an orientation point. That uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I met the woman in front of you, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, my name is Jeannie Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. First, I'd like to thank you for all the work you've done up until now for the region. And as a Vietnamese American, I thank you very much for all the, um, the advancement of the changes in the region. Secondly, I would like to ask specifically about Vietnam and the impacts of the recent trip of President Obama to the region, because Vietnam is one of the members wanted to join the TPP, and we've been working on it for a long time. And Vietnam is also one of the main claimants in the situation in the South China Sea. Um, Vietnam has also had a long, almost ve a very long history in engagement with the French, European... I have European. to ask you to ask the question, please, because so we're really So my, my question is, what impacts do you expect the transatlantic period to Asia have in Vietnam? What role can Vietnam play? And where do you see the impacts of the recent trip of the President Obama um, regarding the role of Vietnam since he did not visit Vietnam? Okay, thank, thank you. you. Could you pass the microphone behind you? Just uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, Natalie Liu with uh, Voice of America. Could the uh, pivot or rebalance to Asia have been done in such a way that it would um, at least appear to antagonize China a bit less. Right, yes, right here. There's two together. Maybe you could have one question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Russell. Bingu Wang with Hong Kong Phoenix TV. I have a more detailed question. Um, when you were in Japan, we saw the joint statement. As you know, um, the word Senkaku you put in there actually surprised many one, even in Washington, D.C. Um, could you tell, about, to tell us about, um, have you ever hesitated to put Senkaku in the joint statement? Because there was reports saying there was a difference between U.S. and Japan, and if so, what made you change your mind? Thank you. Okay, we're going to stop there. Let Danny take whatever you like out of okay. that uh, menu. Thank you. Well, let me answer the collective questions uh, by saying a few words about the president's recent trip, uh, because I think that spans uh, the issues raised. Uh, I went with the president. We began in Japan, went on to the Republic of Korea, uh, from there to Malaysia, and ended in the Philippines. and. Uh, just got back about 48 hours ago. The significance of the trip uh, includes uh, the fact that he visited um, three treaty allies of the United States uh, and one burgeoning security partner, Malaysia. Uh, also the fact that the trip integrated Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia. And I think it's important uh, that the United States is 
looking at the broad Asia-Pacific region as a whole, and that the trip underscored in economic terms, in security terms, and in people-to-people, -people, cultural, uh, political terms, how much the region has in common. Uh, both Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia face uh, challenges uh, from, as I mentioned, transnational threats, global threats like climate change. They're experiencing challenges in territorial and maritime uh, disputes. Um, but both Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia uh, are seeing tremendous uh, economic growth and political development and uh, maturity. Those are positive forces that uh, the U.S. wants to foster and wants to um, participate in. The increasing uh, ties between the United States and ASEAN and each of the 10 ASEAN uh, members, the U.S. strategy of uh, in promoting uh, capacity, uh, expanding the, uh, the wherewithal of the uh, Southeast Asian countries uh, to collaborate in uh, institutional ways uh, to develop their own uh, law, maritime law enforcement uh, mechanisms uh, to, um, to grow their um, political and economic uh, institutions and to promote a greater and more vigorous uh, civil society were major features of the president's trip. Uh, Vietnam plays uh, an important role as a leader in the region and as an active participant in the TPP uh, negotiations. Uh, there is, to my eyes, abundant evidence that uh, Vietnam uh, has decided to engage in uh, a path to reform and um, participation in regional and international affairs that is very, very constructive. I accompanied Secretary Kerry last year when he visited uh, Vietnam uh, and uh, not only went to Hanoi but to Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, he met with a broad spectrum of political leaders, of civil society, and of uh, business leaders. And it's clear that there's change, positive change afoot in uh, Vietnam that matches the, the growth and the dynamism of the rest of the region. In Japan, where we began, uh, the president um, reaffirmed the fact that the U.S.-Japan defense treaty includes a provision that stipulates that its application uh, extends to uh, areas uh, under the administrative control of Japan, uh, and that includes the Senkakus. As he ma himself made clear, this is not a new policy, and surely uh, having the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense uh, affirm this uh, repeatedly uh, and publicly um, meant that it was both proper and appropriate for the president uh, to do likewise. In doing so, he merely removed uh, any doubt that might exist in anyone's mind, uh, both to the facts and to the strength of America's commitment to uh, the security of our allies. But at the same time, he emphasized in Japan, as he did in the Philippines, that Number one, the U.S. is not a party to any of these disputes. We don't take a position on any of the claims. Number two, that the strong preference of the United States is that uh, differences be managed diplomatically without coercion, without uh, the use or the threat of force, that there are abundant uh, diplomatic channels for peaceful resolution of these differences. Uh, and certainly, uh, pending resolution, they can and must be uh, managed uh, with restraint uh, and with diplomacy. 
But the third point that he made, which goes to the issue of China, is this. That the United States, as the President said, um, welcomes uh, the peaceful rise of China. Uh, that the United States seeks and has a uh, constructive partnership uh, with China. And that uh, the United States uh, seeks uh, an active role uh, by China in participating in the uh, rulemaking process uh, in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, we want and have facilitated China's voice uh, being heard and help to ensure that China has a seat at the table. And as the President indicated, uh, we harbor the reasonable expectation that like the United States and like others, uh, as a rule maker, as a participant uh, in regional discussions, uh, that China will consider itself uh, equally bound by the same rules that apply to all of us. There is um, no anti-China uh, intent or dimension to our Asia policy. To the contrary, uh, President Obama has met, if I'm counting right, something on the order of 19 times with Chinese leaders, with the President or the Prime Minister of China uh, since he's taken office. The United States, although we accept that there are both areas of cooperation and areas of competition with China, have found important uh, projects, uh, for example, climate change, where cooperation uh, between the US and China has not only been possible, frankly, it is indispensable to making headway on a, on a matter of existential importance to the entire world. My name is uh, Hans Benendijk, and it's a great pleasure for me to be here. We're sort of pressed for time, so I'm going to set aside the half hour's worth of opening comments that I had planned to make. Um, I do want to thank the uh, Dutch government uh, and the Dutch foreign ministry in particular for supporting this effort. Um, I do want to make three very brief points. Uh, the first point is that uh, one of the purposes of this book uh, was to try to correct a series of misimpressions, uh, myths, if you will, uh, about the pivot, uh, and those included that it, it's all about defense policy, that it's about containing China, uh, that it's purely rhetorical, uh, that it produces winners and losers, and one of the losers is Europe, uh, and that the scope for uh, transatlantic cooperation is limited. Uh, those are all myths. Uh, Julie Smith's chapter in the book, which you'll get uh, later today, uh, addresses all of those, uh, but the purpose, uh, one of the purposes of the book was to uh, correct that narrative. Uh, the second uh, purpose was to try to sort of push forward uh, on this agreement that was reached a couple of years ago between the United States and the EU uh, with regard to greater cooperation in the pivot to Asia. Uh, that happened, but we felt that it needed uh, a clearer agenda. And so one of the main purposes of the book was to focus on that agenda. And you'll see that most of the chapters in the book uh, focus on that. Uh, they focus on uh, a bit on security policy and the role uh, for NATO, but they also focus on uh, some of the things that Danny just mentioned, uh, the importance of institutions, rule of law, reconciliation, norms, and the role that together we can, uh, we can play uh, to, uh, to develop that in, in uh, Asia. Uh, Another element to this uh, transatlantic pivot uh, is about problem solving. Problem solving uh, with regard to environmental issues, international crime, human rights, et cetera. And then finally, there's the economic dimension, which Jeff will talk about in a minute. Uh, it's about these two sets of trade negotiations, who in many ways can underpin this new trilateral relationship that we're talking about. Uh, finally, um, let me, I'm sure some of you are wondering, is the pivot and this transatlantic notion of pivoting with Europe still valid uh, after what we have seen over the last uh, couple of months, the challenges that we have in Ukraine and Crimea uh, from uh, President Putin? The answer in my mind is yes, more than ever. Uh, things have not changed in Asia. 
The pivot was never intended, uh, as Danny said, to reduce in any way America's commitment to Europe. And in fact, one could argue that as the United States uh, focuses a bit more back on Europe to deal with this new challenge, that Europe ought to be leaning with us in the other direction as well, so that we have sort of a burden-sharing relationship and so that uh, we can uh, have the benefit of this strong transatlantic partnership when we deal with Asia. Now, um, let me turn with those very brief comments to the panel. Uh, I got a note last night from Julie Smith saying uh, she has bronchitis uh, and has lost her voice. I suggested she might speak with sign language, but she didn't take me up on that. Uh, Patrick Cronin has very graciously uh, written one of the major chapters in our book. He's graciously uh, agreed to uh, stand in. Let me start with uh, Miriam uh, von den Heuvel, though, who is the uh, director of Western Hemisphere, uh, the Western Hemisphere Department of the Dutch Foreign Ministry. Let me ask her to start. The, the bios are all available, uh, so I won't uh, spend any time doing it. And I, if I can ask the pan, the, all the panelists to speak in code, uh, do this quickly, uh, five to seven minutes, uh, and then we can have some room for discussion. So, Miriam, uh, can you start, please? Thank you, Hans. Thank you. And let me. Um First of all, congratulate all the authors, and in particular, Hans Binnendijk and Dan Hamilton, and the Center of Transatlantic Relations on the completion of this very important project and the publication of this very interesting book. Three years ago, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where I work, um, we started working on some ideas to redefine the transatlantic relationship um, in a changing world. And one of the authors, Rem Kortweg, sitting here in front of me, was, was part of our team at that time. And at the same time, our colleagues in the ministry working in the Asia department uh, were working on a proposal for a new policy towards Asia. Well, when I met Dan, Dan Hamilton, uh, in fall 2011, and I heard about his ideas to conduct a project on the pivot to Asia, I felt that this coincided so well with the policy questions on transatlantic issues and Asian issues that we were working on in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So um, the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Dutch Embassy here in Washington, we became partners to this very interesting project, and I want to thank all the colleagues for that. Um, today I've been asked to present the Dutch view on the pivot to Asia, and I will limit myself to a few remarks um, as Minister Timmermans uh, will address your audience this afternoon and present his views on transatlantic relations in a changing world. Well, about transatlantic relations. Um, next year we will commemorate um, the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. And the role that the US has played in ending the war and the sacrifice that young soldiers have brought to bring us freedom is at the very, very heart of the transatlantic relationship. But there is much more. I believe that the strong and shared belief in values like individual freedom, open economy, uh, the rule of law and democracy have further strengthened over the years uh, the transatlantic relationship and the cooperation across the uh, Atlantic. And internationally, it is, in my opinion, these very values that have helped build a whole multilateral system promoting free trade, human rights, and international law, that on the international front, and domestically, these values have brought our societies, our citizens, more freedom. They have brought us more security and more prosperity. Um, looking at Asia, I believe that it is fair to say that the 21st century will be known as a century of Asia. The last 20 years, the share of China's and India's economy has tripled. Uh, six out of the 10 most populated countries worldwide are in Asia. Um, Asia is to become the largest producer and the largest con consumer of goods worldwide. Uh, I believe yesterday there was an article in the Financial Times saying that the Chinese economy has become bigger than the US economy. And rapid economic growth goes hand in hand with increased political ambition. Well, given all these facts, it's only normal that the interest of Western countries turns towards Asia. 
And I must say, it's not only Western countries, because when you are in Latin America, when you are in the Middle East, when you are in Africa, you see that there is more and more interaction between these regions and the countries in Asia. But so the central question, I would say, is not so much about the pivot to Asia in itself. It's more about how to pivot and with whom. And in this respect, um, I, I will share with you three elements, I would say perhaps risks or myths, as, as Hans has uh, called them, that still exist and that we need to address and that I believe your book is addressing very well and help, will help us to address uh, and find solution to them. Well, first, there is a risk that economic drivers are the decisive element of defining our relationship with Asia. And I must say that economic and trade motives are extremely important and totally legitimate in an area where we have to overcome a crisis in Europe. But focusing on the economy alone entails risk of short-term gain and long-term loss. We need to keep our focus as European countries and as Netherlands in particular on those elements that I mentioned earlier. I believe huh, that these elements that helped us building our post-World War II order need to be central in that approach towards Asia as well. So promoting a rules-based world order, uh, be it on maritime security, free trade or international security, human rights, needs to be an essential part of our approach to Asia. And until now, we need every time in the Netherlands, but I believe in other European countries as well, uh, to, to, to maintain that focus. It's not only about interesting trading orders uh, or economic uh, opportunities. The second risk that I would like to mention here is that we equal Asia with China. Secretary Russell has already pointed out that, that uh, all the different countries and, and the relations, different relationships that we have with the different countries in Asia. Asia is complex in its diversity and so are the relationships with individual countries. And besides, besides being the region with the largest economic growth, it's also the region that where current and, and latent conflicts exist. And some Asian countries share the same outlook as, as Europe on certain international affairs, and others take a totally opposite stance. So the European countries having certain historic ties uh, with certain Asian countries can be an asset, but it can be a burden as well. Um, in that respect, an approach to Asia cannot be one size fits all. Uh, it has to take into account the differences between the countries, the interaction among Asian countries themselves, and the strategic relationship that we have with each one of them. The third risk is <clears throat> uh, the risk that we consider each other as competitors, or as, as Secretary Russell has said, that we focus more on the competition than on the cooperation. And some believe and I believe that it is true that it still exists up to now, in, at least in the Netherlands and other European countries, that the pivot to Asia means the pivot away from, Brussels, uh, from Europe. And I agree with Hans that we, every time again, we should uh, get rid of that myth and explain uh, that it is not a zero-sum game. Some believe in Europe that having a joint approach decreases competitiveness and a privileged position of an individual country. But in fact, that too is untrue for having a coordinated strategic approach, whether within the EU, and I believe that Rem Kortebe has also pointed out that it still lacks huh, a, a, a coherent EU approach. And so either within the EU or the EU jointly with the US and other partners increases our chances to successfully influence developments. Um, finally, I would like to add one, one last element uh, which we are faced with in the Netherlands currently with um, decreasing human resources, decreasing financial instruments uh, due to the economic crisis. Um, we need more than ever to develop a smart diplomacy. 
and smart diplomacy vis-à-vis -vis Asia or any region in the world uh, requires that we have a proper understanding of international developments, that we are capable of, of defining our interests and that we cooperate strategically with partners with whom we share interests. And in that respect, given the challenges worldwide but also in Asia, I believe that your work and, 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 and your studies represent a tremendous contribution huh, to administrations, to diplomacy, to our own ministry in The Hague to formulate a better policy and a more strategic approach uh, together, EU and the US. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much for that. Let me turn now to Patrick Cronin, who uh, is, runs the Asia programs at the Center for New American Security and is a former colleague of mine at the National Defense University. Patrick. Hans, thank you very much. Um, let me just uh, start with a comment about how 20 years ago, working for you at National Defense University, you were one of the few transatlanticists who were constantly focusing on both the trans-Pacific and, and transatlantic. So the ingredients for a transatlantic pivot have long been, I think, in your, in your veins. Um, they're also in CSIS's veins to some extent in, um, in the sense that when I was working with Kurt Campbell and Julie Smith, for whom I'm filling in this morning, um, we had many discussions about being bogged down in Iraq. We had Victor Cha and other great officials working on Asia account, so it wasn't new. But we were thinking very much about how uh, the future of the world looks so different in the 21st century. So the ingredients for the, the pivot, Kurt Campbell is an architect under Secretary Clinton and, and Julie Smith very much working on especially transatlantic policy um, coming together. So this really isn't a big stretch to have a transatlantic pivot to Asia. What is the pivot? Let me just make two geostrategic points. I've already had the good fortune of Assistant Secretary Denny Russell explaining official U.S. policy, so let me explain unofficial <laughs> geostrategy. <laughs> um, two points uh, that I will in enlarge and sharpen. Um, Asia's rise that, that Danny talked about is in particular led by China. Um, so that was downplayed in Danny's comments for lots of reasons. The report that um, was issued this week that China will likely overtake the United States as the world's largest economy in purchasing power parity this year is an indicator of this trend of a rising Indo-Pacific region, of which, again, China uh, is critical. India, in that uh, survey, by the way, moves ahead of Japan into the number three position. So it isn't just China. It is really this Indo-Pacific rise that we're trying to deal with. And that's raising two sets of questions that, again, Danny hinted at. Uh, one of them is the security maintenance with all these challenges that we face. The other one is the order building. Yeah. And these are the two challenges we're facing. So in security maintenance, let me just put an image in your mind. If you think about the Chinese military order in the Pacific in 1999, very few aircraft and ships that could project power. 2014, vastly many more, but the quality is inferior. But now think out to 15 years ahead, or to 2035. And that's the trajectory that many in the region are watching and seeing, and they're wondering, well, by what rules will that larger China use its military force? It's a legitimate set of questions, and many Chinese are asking the same questions. Um, and you think about the order building, that's everything from the kind of confidence building measures, such as the code for the sort of uh, unintended um, uh, sort of episodes um, or encounters at sea that Danny Russell talked about, which is non-binding and is even less uh, useful fact than, we have, than the binding coal regs that exist right now and cover both commercial and military shipping, or that the incidents at sea agreement in the Cold War provided for military to military real uh, confidence building measure. So we need to go well beyond that. But to the larger institution building that has to happen in this region. Um, and here's where the rebalancing policy of being a whole of government approach um, and having to work with others in the region and work with Europe is so important because we can't get to the order building or the security without the world really coming together, at least in terms of major powers, major countries coming together to try to, to work on these issues. The pivot that therefore was a really bad term because it suggested such an immediate shift. You've got to think of this like climate change. <laughs> it's a gradual shift. The world is pivoting. 
right? Asia is growing. And so we are all trying to adapt and to integrate in this inclusive rules-based system uh, the rise of Asia. And that's really the second point, which is that the uh, liberal world order, if we can just you know, use the catchphrase of what a, an inclusive rules-based system might include, um, is indeed the extension of the system that Europe and the United States in particular helped to build after, the, after World War II. Um, so we have a, an obligation, we have an opportunity to now take this into the next chapter of that project. And in 2014, there are more and more people around the world asking who makes the rules. Yesterday, I heard perhaps the next Prime Minister of Japan, Ishiba-san, the Secretary General of the Liberal Democratic Party, say, well, we have to ask ourselves in Japan and in Asia, since we did not as a world community stop Assad after chemical weapons were used, did this give the green light to Putin in the Crimea? Now, whatever you think of that question, the fact that it's being asked by a man of that seniority in Asia says that it's, it's a legitimate issue, that people are questioning who makes the rules. Well, that's why you heard, I think, Assistant Secretary Russell talk about Article 5 of the treaty and why he didn't want there to be ambiguity, because this is a time when maybe ambiguity is not helpful. We want people to understand that there are rules. We expect good behavior. We're going to have to come together now to, and create new rules and adapt this system. Anyway, th those are the two points I would make, that this is an urgent uh, sort of important thing. It's not just the big rules. It's also little things. And, and again, Danny mentioned law enforcement, for instance. So when you think about Philippines and Vietnam, countries that are increasingly having to play a critical role in a place like the South China Sea, where there are so many claims, uh, understanding the rule of law starts very small with law enforcement and coast guards. And those are very important too. And those are the practical. That's why the trip by the president in many ways sounded somewhat pedestrian. It was, it was workmanlike because this is a long-term effort. It's, most of it is not that exciting, but it has some huge strategic implications if we don't get it right. So thank you, Hans. Excellent, Patrick, very concise and useful. Uh, let's turn now to Victor Cha, who is a senior fellow uh, and holds the Korea chair here at uh, CSIS, uh, and he was the director of Asian Affairs at the National Security Council uh, some years ago. Victor. Thank you, Hans. Congratulations on a, and to the authors on a great volume, um, and uh, to, uh, to uh, the organizers of this for a really fantastic conference. Um, I'm going to offer an analysis of the pivot um, that will have some not critical, but maybe um, pose some of the uh, address, address some of the challenges to the pivot. I don't do that as an unemployed Republican, um, because uh, I did actually go to college with President Obama. We were in the same class at Columbia. Um, his career has gone a little bit better than mine, but so uh, far, so far, right? But I don't know that. <laughs> 2016. Uh, right, right. I and uh, I would. I just want to reiterate the point about how the, the when we talk about the pivot and Europe and Asia, it is not a zero sum game at all. In fact, I think if you go to a lot of countries in Asia, while they appreciate the terminology and the president's visit and everything, I don't think you get it. This groundswell feeling in Asia that all the attention is on them. Uh, on the contrary, they are they are uh, striving for U.S. attention as much as uh, anybody else. Um, I think one of the most important things when we talk about stability and prosperity in Asia is the whole question of institutions and practices. Um, and these are not necessarily formal, uh, advanced European institutions, but more broadly, simply the level of interaction, the volume of interaction uh, that takes place uh, in Asia. And I think it's fair to say that, relatively speaking, Asia is fairly under-institutionalized, if you use that broad definition. Um, there really aren't uh, any formal institutions in Northeast Asia. Um, Chris and I used to be part of something called the Six Party Talks. Chris Hill and I used to be part of something called the Six Party Talks, but that hasn't met in, what, eight years now? So I don't know if it really exists anymore. Um, there are more in Southeast Asia, relatively more, uh, but there are none in, in South Asia. Um, and the interesting thing to me is that the pivot to Asia is happening at a time, perhaps not without coincidence, where China's rise is causing Beijing to extend its own footprint in all these regions, Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, and South Asia. And so what this is creating is 
a lot more interaction between the United States and China in areas and over issues about which or upon which we have no established patterns of interaction, right? No established institutions, no established patterns of interaction, no established practices. So whether you're talking about instability in North Korea, we don't have an institution or established pattern of interaction or understanding. Whether we're talking about territorial disputes in Asia, uh, including things like the Senkaku Islands, we don't have an established pattern of interaction or institution or understanding uh, with China. Now, to the pivot's credit, it has bolstered a lot of institution building in Asia. As Danny said earlier, with regard to the alliances in Asia, whether you're talking about Japan, Korea, uh, Australia, uh, the new access arrangement in the Philippines, um, uh, to the administration's credit, they have also done a lot with EAS, the East Asia Summit. Um, again, when Chris and I were in government, there was a lot of debate about whether the United States should or shouldn't join EAS. Uh, but this administration made that decision uh, and, uh, and really has done a lot to define the agenda of EAS, um, define it as distinct but complementary to the agenda for APEC. So you give them a lot of credit in that respect. But let me just highlight four challenges. And again, I want to be quick so we can get to uh, discussion and question and answers. And I also want to hear what Jeff has to say, because he really knows what he's talking about. Um, the first, I think, when we, again, when we think about e, uh, Asia, you know, Asia desires to have an East Asian, they desire for a community. They want to have a community like Europe has a community. If you poll Asians and you ask them about the notion of an, uh, of an Asian community or East Asian community, overwhelmingly they want it. So one of the challenges for the pivot is, you know, can the pivot be seen by the region as both a hedge against China and something that's good for the alliances, but also not be seen as an impediment to this building of an East Asian community, right? So that's, I think, a big challenge. The second is something that Danny talked about, and this is the whole question of so-called rebalancing the rebalance. Right? The Senate Foreign Relations Committee report on the rebalance, which I think right now is the best document and print out there on it, it was very clear about how the rebalance is too military focused. And if you look at the President's trip to Asia, it was a great trip, but the headline was all about security. Right? Article 5 in Senkaku in Japan, OPCON transition in Korea, right? defense access arrangement in the Philippines. So can the administration be successful in rebalancing the rebalance, bringing out the other elements of this? Um, linked to this, of course, and the third challenge is TPP. Right. Trans-Pacific Partnership, if, if it can be accomplished, will by far be the most important institution in Asia and the most important legacy of the Obama administration's pivot to Asia, unquestionably. Right. And, the, and, and whether they can get that, I think, is a big question. And the fourth challenge, of course, is history. Europe has dealt with its history much better than Asia. Um, and the pivot, even the United States has generally tried to stay away from these history issues in Asia. But it's very challenging now because it's one of the most prominent issues in the region. And at the same time, the United States cannot pivot to Asia with this being one of the prime issues and not play a larger role in helping uh, to forge pragmatic cooperation in spite of this history. So these, I think, are the four challenges for the pivot. I, I think it's a, I entirely agree with the concept behind it and with the enthusiasm and passion with which the administration pursues it. Uh, but these are some of the challenges we have to think about as we move forward. Victor, thank you very much. Uh, uh, now we're going to turn to one of the four points that you raised and dig into it a bit more, which is this notion of uh, trade and economics as a basis for a not just a uh, transatlantic pivot, but actually a new trilateralism, if you will. Uh, so. Uh, uh, Jeffrey Schott uh, is a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute. Uh, he has been studying uh, both of these trade uh, agreements and uh, knows more about them than anyone else in town, I think. Jeffrey, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Hans. And it has been a great uh, pleasure uh, for me to have the opportunity to work with you and uh, to work with Dan and the other authors and uh, putting this book together. And uh, I congratulate you on the hard work and uh, and seeing it through uh, to uh, to fruition. So congratulations on that. Uh, economists don't speak the same language as political scientists, and. Uh, 
many people say economists don't speak English, and that may be true. But one of the words that you don't hear economists say is pivot. <laughs> um, and uh, so I've had a little hard, uh, bit of difficulty fitting into, uh, as the odd man in this uh, uh, lineup of authors, uh, in, uh, in discussing uh, the very important developments, both economic and strategic, that uh, have been underway for quite some time. From a U.S. perspective, the U.S. economic pivot to Asia started more than 15 years ago. And it has been evident in the marketplace for a long, long time. It has been evident in U.S. policy for a long, long time. Uh, you, can start, you can pick any starting date you want, but clearly the uh, U.S. role in getting China into the World Trade Organization was uh, a, a, a crucial event uh, for uh, uh, transatlantic relations, for uh, transpacific relations, for the global economy writ large. Uh, that was followed by a deepening of U.S. economic engagement in the region. Uh, uh, foremost led by the uh, negotiation of the Korea-U.S. Free Trade Agreement, uh, also agreements with other, other countries, that laid the foundation for the establishment of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was first uh, 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 launched in, during the, at the end point of the Bush administration in September of 2008, uh, but other things were happening in 2008 that uh, economists took greater note of. And so uh, it wasn't until the financial crisis had stabilized, the U.S. economy had stabilized, that the Obama administration was able to pick up the baton that had fallen uh, 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 and uh, start uh, the renewed uh, negotiations of a Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, Europe, at the same time, had been well behind and started emulating the United States only about in the mid-2000s, 2005, 2006, uh, and was very successful in emulating the Chorus FTA and actually implementing it before the Chorus uh, Agreement entered into force uh, because of difficulties here in Washington. Uh, it had, Europe has had less success, however, with other countries in Europe, uh, in Asia, and uh, so there, I think part of the problem uh, in looking at this is Europe has, had been lagging behind, uh, and yet uh, after the financial crisis, both the United States and Europe needed an economic boost. Uh, and a boost that didn't come from just saying, well, we're going to increase our, ex our, our joint efforts working together uh, uh, to deal with Asia, but how can we work together to improve our, uh, our efficiency and productivity of our economies so that we would be more competitive and therefore be able uh, to play a bigger role in the growing Asian economies? And I think that, in a sense, is, is the economic pivot that I was trying to talk about in the chapter uh, that, that I wrote. Uh, the the TTIP is uh, a, a, an important part of that. Uh, it was founded on the thoughtful uh, deliberations and recommendations of the high-level working group on jobs and growth uh, uh, that issued its report and led to the launching of the negotiations. The focus of those negotiations are boosting economic growth and jobs in the United States and in Europe uh, with the view that if we have healthier economies, if we have greater productivity, in our, in, our, in our economies, then we will be able to play a bigger role and, be, uh, and, 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 and have more influence in the global economy. That's crucial. And doing so uh, means that the, that the U.S. and European officials need to look at the restrictions, both traditional trade and, and broader regulatory uh, 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 policies, that unduly add to transaction costs that impede transatlantic trade and investment. That's what the uh, 
negotiations are all about. We have already the biggest commercial, bilateral commercial relationship in the world, and yet uh, uh, we can do much, much better and become more competitive and therefore improve our footprint in, uh, in, in, in global markets, including in Asia. That's the challenge that uh, uh, the TTIP negotiators have. It depends, importantly, on the willingness of U.S. and European officials to change existing policies. Uh, if we don't agree that we can improve what we're already doing, there's not going to be a great scope for improving the efficiency and productivity of our, uh, of our uh, firms and workers. And uh, so there's great opportunity to do much better, uh, but there's also a political challenge because some of those uh, policies uh, have strong vested political interests. If I could have one more minute, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think it's important to note that the economic dimension, though, and the, the working together on the economic side in TTIP uh, underscores the importance of having a broader alliance and deepening and reinforcing the already crucial alliance that we have with, with Europe. And that's been shown very readily with regard to the, the crisis in Ukraine. Uh, we need to work together very closely to address this, both on medium-term energy supply and distribution issues, which will have a broad economic uh, benefit for our, for our economies, but also will help rebalance some of the uh, vulnerabilities on, this, on the strategic side. But we also have to deal with short-term measures to discourage further uh, Russian expansionism. And that's much more difficult because the European economy is much more uh, uh, dependent on trade with Russia, has much greater, 10 times greater uh, uh, foreign investment in the Russian economy than, than the United States, and therefore is much more vulnerable to disruptive sanctions that uh, would affect European production and, and employment. We need to uh, uh, keep that in mind as we build our partnership. We need to work, find ways of working together uh, to ensure that the transatlantic pivot includes a deepening of, of, of the transatlantic comedy. And uh, uh, I, I think uh, the, the many chapters in this book uh, help, will help uh, guide policymakers as they go through these uh, very turbulent times. Thank you very much. Jeff, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to open it up for questions now, but I just did want to note that uh, as you listen to administration officials, uh, you will hear the word rebalancing. Uh, you will also note that when President Obama talks about it, he talks about the pivot. He's a basketball player. Uh, the pivot is a basketball term. Uh, I play basketball too, and I know that when one pivots, you keep a foot on the ground. That's your pivot foot. And you keep your balance. And you are able, in a pivoting situation in basketball, to turn quickly and be agile and move in any direction that you need to move in. So in some ways, I think President Obama really understands the, the, this policy uh, well. Okay, with that uh, little caveat, let me uh, open it up to uh, some questions. I'll maybe take two or three over here first, then over there. And if you could bring the, uh, just identify yourself, please. Hi, thank you for the panel. My name is Dina Lee. I'm with the Atlantic Council's Brent School Crop Center. And I have a question for uh, Mr. Scott. Can you elaborate uh, on the way to coordinate the TTIP negotiation and the TPP negotiation, both of which are really like lar two largest uh, trade negotiation in the world? Thank you. So what was the specific question? How to coordinate the two, right, okay. Okay, over here. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Ira Strauss, Committee on Eastern Europe and Russia and NATO. Uh, all of us are talking the same thing, not to set Pacific against Atlantic, and yet it seems to me the only one up there, the only one today who has given a language that can overcome that is the chair of this session who spoke of trilateral, a single word, instead of two separate words, Europe, Asia, Atlantic, Pacific. It seems to me that's crucially important to come up with a language that will unite these rather than dividing them. There, there are other words. There's first world, there's OECD, there's industrial democracies. Uh, but it's extremely important to change the language in this. 
Uh, and it's, I think it's very valuable to think of Asia as two places, third world Asia or China oriented Asia or continental Asia as the Japanese call it, or maritime first world Western oriented Asia. Those are two separate things much more different from each other than first world Pacific is from first world Atlantic. And if one looks historically, Australia and New Zealand were always part of the Atlantic grouping. Uh, OECD has existed for 30 years now, uh, more, 40 years, 50 years. Uh, it, it's very sad that we don't have an effective language which unites these and we allow these to be played against each other. The competition should be seen more like the competition between Mediterranean NATO and Nordic NATO. Uh, Asia's growth should be seen as an extension wing of the Atlantic rather than a competing wing against it. I hope that people can be inventive with language. That's my question. Good. Uh, let me take one or two more, and maybe the panelists could take notes and answer the ones that you want to focus. Ma'am, yes. Thank you. My name is Chin Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. I come back to the point that Dr. Cronin brought up Indo-Pacific and whether you see the Indo-Pacific plays in with the transatlantic pivot to Asia, where does uh, India play in, in the TPP, potentially, maybe in the long term, but in the current trades. And as um, a connection between the, the TTIP and the TPP, do you think, from the TTIP point of view, the TPA is important? Because in two, 2002, we did have the TPA, the, the trade, um, promotion authority was given to the president at the time, which is helpful in the WTO case. So you think we should somehow ask the U.S. Congress to promote the TPA? Thank you. Okay, maybe one more uh, question if we have one. Over here, please. Yes, uh, Dave is Joe, retired Foreign Service. I'd like to pick up on the point that uh, Victor Cha mentioned about a, po a possible U.S. role in dealing with some of the history issues in East Asia. And uh, I'm not quite sure what that role could be, but I was wondering how the European participants here might view a U.S. role in resolving historical issues in Europe. I don't recall that there was such a role, that France and Germany took the leads on that. Uh, I was wondering whether we would have problems in Europe, if we tried to play any role on dealing with historical issues there, given our own experiences with Europe, I think we would have similar problems in Asia, given our own uh, uh, involvement in the, the way that uh, the Second World War ended with the atomic bombings and Victor's justice. I'd like to comment on that. Let me perhaps. Uh, Go down the line and see which ones you'd like to take, uh, starting with uh, Miriam. Um, well, perhaps very briefly on the last question. Sure. Yeah. Um, would European countries be prepared for a U.S. role for historic uh, to help solving historic issues on the European continent, and whether that would work also in Asia? I think that the well, but I cannot speak for the U.S., but I can imagine that the U.S. is perf perfectly fine when partners can do it for themselves. But if there is an offer to facilitate and the partners are willing to take that on, I see that there would be a possibility for the U.S. to play a role in that respect. Um, uh, I believe that in many cases we have felt that it was useful. Even your, look at European history. I mean, there was at a certain point with the building of the European Union and the integration of the European Union, we helped overcome problems between some of the individual member states that brought us stability and security and prosperity. But at the same time, this could not have been done, I believe, it should, was there not a role from outside and the preparedness from outside, notably from the US, to play a constructive role in that uh, part. Okay. Let me pick up on the history question, first of all. I mean, yesterday in the Washington Post, the China Daily insert was, um, front page headline was all about Nanjing survivors. Uh, the Nanjing massacre uh, obviously didn't just happen. Uh, so the fact that they're putting it in the newspaper in Washington Post uh, today suggests that maybe there's an issue here. 
um, as Victor Cha suggested. And I think there is a role for Europe to play, but it's not necessarily for governments to necessarily lead on. It's for universities and the civil society um, to help raise the standards of understanding and the common understanding. That's where um, this is vital because of rising nationalism in, in Asia. Uh, nationalism is different in different places, and Chinese nationalism is being driven and, and, and uh, sort of uh, is a driver of policy in some ways that could be very negative. But in Japan and Korea, the nationalism there is limiting opportunities. It's an opportunity cost in terms of cooperation. That's why it was so important for the president to put his arm around his two good friends, President Park and Prime Minister uh, Abe, uh, in The Hague, uh, and say, look, let's get together and start uh, making some progress on this relationship. And I think as a result of that right now, quietly, there is a deal being worked out, I hope it's true, uh, by the end of this year that Japanese and Korean uh, governments will make some progress on this sex slave comfort women issue, which is one of the uh, thorniest issues. Um, and uh, if that's the case, then it paves the way for a summit meeting, paves the way for defense cooperation, which yeah. is needed for dealing with the uh, Korean Peninsula. Exactly. I think language, by the way, is very important. Trilateral is an important new opportunity, and it's in this book uh, with some great recommendations. Um, but we have to recognize this is the uh, proverbial noodle bowl of many overlapping sets of relations and institutions. Um, and there are lots of ways that European countries, the EU, Europe and North America can play uh, together in this region and must play. Um, the final point would simply be to note that in the Singapore Straits Times today, my Oxford classmate Jonathan Isle wrote a very dyspeptic piece on the Obama rebalancing policy. This is sort of old European think, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of raising questions about um, uh, accusing the United States essentially of budget cutting, masquerading as strategy, is the phrase he used. Um, yes, there, we're. I would look at it just the opposite, which is to say, because we live with fiscal austerity, we have to be more intelligent about our strategy. And we're thinking about these long-term trends that we talked about, the security maintenance and the order building in the Indo-Pacific. So this is a vision of a strategy, the beginning of it. It didn't come out of whole cloth new, but it is the latest iteration of this US policy. And now we've got an opportunity in this transatlantic pivot to do it together. Vicar. Um, in terms of um, uh, sort of uh, views on Asia, the gap between the U.S. and Europe, whether there's a common language. So I'm not an expert on Europe, but I have always found both in government and outside of government that the gap has always, it's not, the gap has not been on economic trade or business issues. The gap has always been on the strategic issues where the United States fundamentally sees Asia as a region of strategic importance. Uh, and for Europe, while some may view that, it, it, it just doesn't permeate the policy like it does um, in, the, in the United States. On history, um, the, uh, I guess when I said that it's a challenge for the pivot, um, I think it is a challenge. It's not necessarily advocating that the United States must play a role to resolve all these disputes because, first of all, I don't think they, can, they can't, they can't play that role, um, and secondly, these, these issues are never going to be resolved. I mean, history is never easily resolvable. Um, having said that, um, I think the administration does have to deal with the fact that we are so-called pivoting to Asia, and you know, the, the, the number one issue right now is the inability of our two allies, two key allies, Japan and Korea, to work together. So. Um, there's something that the United States has to do, and I would say, I would argue on these sorts of issues, you know, the status quo is changing um, in terms of what the Koreans and the Japanese are doing on the history issues, the status quo is changing, and in terms of, in very slowly, the United States is also moving off the status quo in terms of how it responds to these things, you know, making statements, critical statements of the Japanese Prime Minister going to Yasukuni Shrine. Um, or encouraging in the, in the way that they've done active cooperation uh, between the two. Um, I entirely agree with Patrick that um, uh, often where a lot of this work can be done or a lot of the, a lot of the um, ground can be made softer is through uh, track 1.5, track 2, these sorts of things I think are very important. Um, to me, the primary obstacle, in Asia, I mean, looking at the European example, and here I have done some work. The primary 
difference between Europe and Asia in terms of history is that um, uh, in Asia, unlike in Europe, um, in all countries, it is still not domestically, politically legitimate to seek historical reconciliation. That's, that's the big gap that I see. And, you know, can the United States help in that role? I, I don't know. But um, I think as an analyst, that to me would be the thing that we have to look at and work on. And the United States, the role it can play, you know, I mean, the thing we have to understand is that and for Asianists, we've heard this all the time. Most of the countries in Asia uh, view the United States or trust the United States more than they trust each other. And so in that sense, the United States is in a very central role. Um, and if this is the central problem, it's hard to see how these, th these two things don't have to meet in some fashion. Well, all the questions are very interesting, and I'd like to comment on all of them, but I'll just focus on, on, on the specific economically oriented one. Otherwise, I'll take too much time. Um, the first question was a very astute one about coordination of uh, TTIP and TPP. Actually, those initiatives are inherently coordinated. They have common roots. Uh, if you think about the basic structure of those agreements, it starts from the common uh, experience that the United States and Europe had with uh, constructing a free trade agreement with Korea. Uh, that provides a large part of the sort of boilerplate of a, of a TTIP, uh, uh, but it also demarks areas where each, where we each w uh, worked with Korea, there were limitations based on a more traditional trade agreement, we could go further because of the richness and, 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 and complexity of our uh, uh, commercial relationship. Uh, and so we can build on that experience, uh, and, and uh, the coordination occurs uh, almost uh, naturally. Uh, now, that has important implications uh, and I won't use the word trilateral because trilateral is not the right word. The right word is global or multilateral. Uh, because if you have the TTIP and the TPP with a common agenda for broadening economic interactions, uh, then you're covering, and, and you have more and more countries in Asia who are thinking about joining the TPP because of the incentive that that agreement will have for their own economic reform and productivity growth. And, and that includes Korea, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, and also possibly China. China's been working very hard, study, looking very closely on how it could use TPP to advance its desire for economic reform at home. Uh, and while that's not politically on the radar screen for this year or next year, uh, things happen very fast in Asia. Things change very quickly, and so it's conceivable that even within this decade, one could one could see Chinese uh, requests to to participate in TPP and in willingness to undertake TPP type reforms. That's would have sounded idiotic uh, uh, just two years ago. Maybe some of you still think it is, uh, but it 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 is in the realm of possible policy reform. If you do that, then who is left out uh, of this trilateral relationship, all working on a, on a common platform of, of economic reform? And it's the poorest countries. It's the countries of Africa, some Latin American countries, some countries in, in, in South Asia. Uh, and so it's, it's almost an imperative to coordinate efforts in the TPP and TTIP and find common ground to bring those mega regionals and find precedents to, to restore uh, a proper multilateral negotiation in Geneva. That's the challenge that WTO countries are facing this year in, in trying to build on the mega regionals and restore a, 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 a constructive WTO negotiating uh, 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 agenda. And uh, hopefully they will do that and uh, that will bring in India and the others. Uh, Jeff, thank you very much. Um, 
Uh, just a, my own comment on the notion of trilateralism. Uh, I think you're probably right in the economic sphere. The goal is to globalize these sets of uh, free trade agreements. Uh, but in the broader sense, uh, we use the word trilateralism in the subtitle of the book uh, because we wanted to get away from this notion of uh, the United States or the United States and Europe together sort of imposing uh, or engaging too heavily in Asia. This and the chapter in the book that we have written by our Asian colleagues about Asian institutions and sensitivities just underlined for me the importance of doing this thing very carefully. Uh, that if we're going to engage this way, it's very important that we figure out which Asian institutions, ASEAN and others, we plug into. That requires a great deal of consultation in advance and a great deal of cooperation among our friends and allies uh, in, uh, in Asia. So hence this notion of trilateralism. It gets you away of this, from the sense of you know, our coming in and imposing. So with that, uh, and I, I will also note that we have Michael Schaefer here with us, who has just come from a Trilateral Commission meeting, so you may want to address this when you have a, when you have a chance. Uh, all right, do we, uh, is uh, Derek uh, here? No, shaking his head. All right, so um, I sort of hesitate to let the group go for, uh, for a coffee break. Uh, well, um, why don't we take a sort of a five-minute break? I think we probably ought to wrap it up here. Let's take a five-minute but no longer break in place, uh, and please join me in uh, thanking this panel.